you yeah. know, Roger Waters did this. Like, holy crap. And um, so it was always in your blood to be a producer then, because I feel like Dark Side of the Moon is that that album is like the producer's album. Everybody, anyone who goes into music production, like like if they're into soundscapes and that kind of thing, like just the Dark Side of the Moon is like the source of that. And I guess maybe like later on, like Radiohead and that kind of like soundscape art rock thing. Exactly. And so like from that part, like I was that's the part I was like, oh, my God, like this is awesome being here. But I will have to admit, like the time the things that I loved uh, right before going there were all cut at other studios. You know, obviously the Stones didn't record at Abbey Road, and uh, I was enamored by anything Amy Winehouse did at the time, which wasn't done, again, I believe all of her stuff was done at Metropolis. It was just a whole different kind of thing, and uh, yeah, it, it was it was awesome, and obviously there was so much knowledge and so much gear and you know at at that point in my life i i knew nothing about any of it like right you know even when i listened to songs like as a kid growing up i guess i had no interest in like how they got the sound it was more of like can i play this and right and do i enjoy listening to it it was a it's a much more different kind of thing cuz i remember uh you know i listened to the packy podcast and you know the one of the profound things that i you know i remember him saying is like wanting to like tear this stuff apart and you know figure out how they did this stuff and you know i guess i didn't really start digging into that until i was an adult wow <laughs> well so, so let's fast forward let's fast forward a little bit so sure. so what are you up to these days specifically like you have a you have a recording studio uh is it is it just you or is it other people is it like a facility uh it is a uh, well, it is a facility. Uh, it's just me. Uh, I had business partners at the beginning, and that didn't work out. And uh, my studio is called Ridgeway Recording. Uh, it's located in Evanston, Illinois, just uh, basically 10, 15 minutes north of the city and uh, where Northwestern is. And I've been doing it here. I've I opened up my studio officially in 2013 and ever since I've been just kind of cranking away and uh really kind of made it a mission uh especially talking to the people in London. I was really starting to focus on things that actually mattered in recording and things that didn't, you know, when I built out this space uh cuz it's it's in my home which is a uh a typical Chicago bungalow style home and we blew out the whole basement and refinished it and dug it out. And, you know, it's a studio. Wow. So the whole focus has been, you know, gear related and making sure that everything is about capturing performances the way that we're all used to hearing it and, you know, not wasting money on frivolous things for maybe some experienced things, that don't really add up to anything sonically. Mm. So, so what do you mean exactly? You know, I, I didn't put a lot into like, you know, making a lounge area and like making it like off the wall, like, oh yeah, we just want to come here and hang. It was like, no. I it's utilitarian was, and like it works. Right. I would rather throw that money into a nice vintage microphone that captures a performance and... Beautifully. Yeah, exactly. And that was the one thing that um, I felt like was missing in the landscape that I'm in, in the city that I'm in, is I felt like there were people who were not kind of really digging into the kind of like basics of things. Not that you can't make great recordings with, you know, SM57s and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not about that. But if push comes to shove, I would rather make recordings with U47s. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, man. I'll just be I'll just be jealous and use my my Slate uh, VMS for the U forty seven sound for now. Exactly. I mean, you know. it, whatever works is you know. I I like I said, I'm very fortunate to be doing what I'm doing with the stuff that I'm doing. And it, well, clearly you've you've been able to attain all this stuff over years of like doing good work and like you know staying uh, in business, <laughs> yes, <laughs> if you will. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah, again, fortunate. That's amazing. So, do you have like a philosophy? I guess beyond that, in, ter in terms of like recording and production, like how does your workflow work? Like, how do you meet artists? Like, how does it begin? So, um, for the most part, everything is word of mouth. Um, 
and people, you know, listening to some of the stuff that I've done and, you know, just calling me up or whatever. And then we kind of, my big thing is always having a talk with the artist and really figuring out what they're looking for, where their end goal is. Like, you know, do they want this to try and, are they trying to get signed? Are they just doing this as a legacy thing? What do they want out of this studio experience? What do they want me to do? You know, am I going to be playing most of the instruments? Am I going to be, you know, arranging and all this stuff for producing? Or am I just pushing buttons and, you know, getting out of the way? Because I think um, yeah. that's a skill set that has been um, completely lost, to say the least, in certain aspects of like, um, you know, yeah. if you have an engineer and a producer, you know, unless the producer asks the engineer, the engineer is just there to capture the sounds and make sure everything is going the way the producer's going. And, you know, in a way, not so much have an opinion. And so I try and really make sure that. I'm, I gauge what the client wants so that I'm never overstepping my bounds and I'm always making them feel comfortable. And I think the biggest thing is always trying to get to that comfort level as quick as possible, um, which I think yeah. in my situation of being in a home, it's already comfortable. So as long as you're comfortable with me, you, my clients, from what I've always been told of just kind of like, this is, it's home, like, you know, it's in a home. Like we haven't sacrificed any quality because you know the gear is up to par with any major studio. Um, so it's it's kind of just like trying to get people to come in, relax, and get the best performance, and not worry about like time and you know, oh my god, like we got to get this done because we have no money and yada yada yada. And I yeah, feel sure. and I feel like when you do that, and you kind of even if you're charging you know, by the hour, whatever your scheme is, if you kind of take that out of the artist's mind that, you know, that money is an issue, believe it or not, people get stuff done way quicker and way better because there's not that, you know, that looming, that doom and gloom hanging over their head. Yeah. That's like the argument to like charge by project and not by hour, I feel like, because you kind of just like, you're paying me to get it done and you're paying me because of my expertise and like, it doesn't matter to you how long it takes me to do my work as long as you're happy with the product. So, like, Exactly. And it's one of those things that I feel like kind of starts to get lost. And I had this kind of existential crisis in the last year of like, who am I as a producer and as like a musician uh, and like and everything. Sure. And um, I really think you hire a producer because of what they like, what their musical yeah. preferences are. Um, Absolutely. Like, you shouldn't just hire a producer or an engineer because they're good at something. Because at the end of the day, if you're hiring someone, they should be good at it. I mean, that's like the litmus test. If, if they're charging money and it's at the same rate as everyone else, they should be able to perform at the same rate as everyone, which we all know is maybe not always the case. But So I feel like that if someone is coming to me, they know what kind of music I like. They know what I'm trying to get out of them, what um, what struggles we might have, what we're gonna you know what we're gonna dig down into the trenches to get, and at the end of the day, that you know we might be on ends, but I will know that at the end of the day they will look and say I am very proud of what I just did and what I'm hearing and what I have to take home, and I think to me that's the most important thing is like really, you know, showing people that need it, like how to really get through that wall and come out the other side even more successful than they thought that they could be. That's awesome. Yeah, there's not there's nothing worse than, you know, working hard with an artist and they don't even release the track. So like if you know if they if they're putting it out, that means they're proud of it and right. and you've done the you've done the proper job. And also like you were saying earlier, it's just like, you know, if they're comfortable and I guess that's part of that is like the people skills and just like you know, being down to earth and like, you know, not not being too too much of a jerk because I feel like a lot of audio engineers have a tendency to go jerk mode. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's like that's how you that's how you that's how you succeed. Yeah. And for me, my business and myself and I guess me as an adult, you know, even when I was a professional playing musician, my thing has always been honesty and 
like you said, yes, that can sometimes come off as being a jerk. But I, I think, um, you know, when m- me and my clients and the people who we all work with kind of understand that nothing that I say or try and do to coach someone to try and get to where I think that they can be is a direct insult on them or anything like that. It's more of like, I can see, like, you know, I think, and I learned this, I think, being an athlete when I was younger, you know the people who you can coach to be even greater than they are. And you know the people yeah. who just show up and they think they're the best but have nothing behind it and there's nothing to coach and as much as you coach it regresses and so for me when I find that little gem I like to push it and I like to push it as hard as I can because I know that again even if they walk out of the live room and they're like well that was that was intense and like what what was going on and I'm like all right just just listen to what you just did and they'll be like, oh yeah, like that's that's great. Like everything's gone. Like <laughs> you, you might have been right. at each other's throats for the last 15 minutes, but now it's like, oh, we're, we're good. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like what you're doing is you're just, you're, even if you're being like intense with the artist, you're, you're, you're doing it for their own benefit. And if they right. could see that, you know, the results of that, then you're still, they're still their friend and they realize you're there to help them. And like, obviously some artists can't handle tough love, but many artists can handle tough love. And I guess it's about the psychology of figuring out when you can and when you can't do it, like as you said. Exactly. And I mean, the whole recording game is, you know, a psychology game at its yeah. best. And I majored in psychology. I didn't, I didn't know <laughs> how well it would come in handy. <laughs> well, actually, I don't think about it at all, but, but, but it's funny how much I'm using psychology in, right. in, in, my, in my day-to-day situation. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a, it's a full-time music job, but it's also a full-time, like, getting people through. Exactly. It's a (laughs) full-time that. And it's, it's, I love it. I mean, for me, it's another way that I can connect with someone about it. Because again, the the deeper you can connect with people about the the art that they're making and what they're trying to get out of it and the journey that they want to be on, the better you can serve them. Because, you know, if I have a conversation with someone after, you know, six days of working on something and it's like, oh man, like this is what you're trying to do. Like, you know, yeah, I wish we talked about this in pre-production, but at the same time, it's kind of like, all right, well then let's try mixing this track up like this and throwing some stuff like this. And they're like, oh yeah, like I didn't even know I wanted that. Be like, yeah, it just comes from talking and conversations and trying to like really dive into who you are, who you want to be as an artist. Maybe you don't know. And really trying to figure that out. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you think, be, coming from the classical like composition background, like how has that like informed your your production technique and, and style? Well, I would say I'm always trying to find the right arrangement. Um, I think that that's where a lot of artists um, fall into a, a lot of traps and. You know, at the end of the day, I I really do. I mean, I don't know how to make someone's song in the sense of like before starting to work on it. I don't I don't want to have a preconceived notion of where things should go. But I also in the back of my mind am thinking of this as like, you know, any great symphony or any great symphonic work of like, how do we go through this realm and range of emotions and how can we really tell this story? Because yes, you've got, at the end of the day, a song should always work on just voice, guitar, or piano. Those two elements, you know, basically melody and accompaniment, which if you think about any, you know, sonata form or sonata from way back in the 16, 17, and 1800s, that's what you had with small chamber music. You had right. the soloist and the accompanist. And if a work could stand in that vein, it obviously would flourish in a larger vein. And so I think at the end of the day, that's the most important thing in really making sure that the the core of things are there. And then it's, you know, in lack of better terms, is just dressing up a pig. You know, it's figuring out yeah. how to arrange this song, what elements we want where, you know, how do we want things to hit? You know, I, I think referencing is a very big thing that so many people skip and yeah. 
don't do throughout the process, you know, there's a very, it's a very easy to get lost in a production and working on a song. 